Federal and state officials are ramping up efforts to prepare for a possible outbreak. The governor has declared the coronavirus a public health emergency now here in New Mexico after three cases were confirmed by the state today. Um, I want to announce a series now of uh, orders. I feel like this is the right call. Seeing spikes in COVID-19 cases with some breaking records, including New Mexico. People are genuinely scared. I'm an advocate just for safety. We're thrilled that we're at these levels right now. A little more normalcy. To be there, to be able to do something and not feel like you're just stuck watching it. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for Coronavirus Impact, our recovery in New Mexico. We are now at one full year of COVID in our state. And it's been a year unlike any of us have ever seen. Our children figuring out how to learn in a new way and our teachers relearning how to teach. So many challenges facing all of us. For most of us, we've had to change how we do our jobs. Businesses across our communities trying to stay afloat. And sadly, the pandemic has taken the jobs of so many New Mexicans. Not just work, but play. The virus is impacting just about everything we do, totally redefining things like sports. From the professionals to your kids, fields, courts, pools left empty for months and young athletes missing out on big opportunities. But there are also stories of perseverance and hope, innovations in technology, communities lifting up their neighbors in need, new heroes emerging. This one hour special explores not just how we got to where we are today, but also what's next for New Mexico and our recovery. It reflects a year of stories from the entire Act 7 News team. After the first COVID case was announced in Wuhan, China in December of 2019, people in countries everywhere were concerned. Then President Trump tried to limit international travel into the U.S. and Governor Lujan Grisham tried to do the same with visitors into New Mexico. But the virus could not be stopped. The first U.S. case was confirmed in January of last year near Seattle, Washington. And then two months after that, it hit home. We now have four confirmed cases in New Mexico. March 11th, 2020, the day that would change every one of our lives forever. The governor declared a public health emergency today. That first day, four cases. The next day, six more. So the governor did the math and shut down schools for three weeks. And for the safety of their kids, most parents agreed. I feel like this is the right call. And while the governor is dealing with the COVID crisis at home, there are New Mexicans stuck on a cruise ship at sea and they can't dock in a U.S. port because of COVID. If they are frustrated and tired and exasperated, it is a fair emotional response. It would take days for Cynthia and Mark Rizzo to finally get back home. And in a week filled with executive orders and public health orders, in an attempt to crack down on COVID, the governor limits capacities at bars, restaurants, and other gathering places to just 50%. We're certainly complying with all the regulations that came out in the last day. But just three days later, she limited places to eat to offer delivery and takeout only. But that's not all. Malls locked up and theaters went dark, all ordered to shut down. We also recognize that businesses uh, uh, that may need to operate, that they're able to do so with those extreme cautions. By this time, COVID-19 was exploding across the country and in New Mexico, just two weeks after the first case was reported, we were up to 112 positive tests. So the governor went a step further, telling everyone to stay home and closed all businesses except for essential stores and services, wanting only their employees and at the time students to be able to leave home. But just 48 hours later, Lujan Grisham closes the books on in-class learning for New Mexico's kids. It's quite clear that it's not yet safe to be able to bring our students back into school um, and that we still have more to do. Welcome to the Albuquerque International Sunport. But the governor had more to do, trying to tackle COVID with travelers, ordering anyone who comes into New Mexico to quarantine for two weeks. So beginning in March of 2020, we all had to change the way we shop, eat, travel, entertain ourselves, and how our kids learn. That was just in the first 16 days that the COVID-19 pandemic turned New Mexico upside down. It is still here and all over the world.
New Mexicans are used to hearing red or green and usually we're talking about chili, but those colors now have a new meaning. At the start of this year, the state introduced a system to evaluate COVID in each county. State leaders look at two numbers. They want fewer than eight cases per 100,000 people and a test positivity rate lower than 5%. Both of those are measured over a two week period. If a county is higher on both, they're in the red, meaning tight restrictions on businesses. If they meet one number, it's yellow and restrictions loosen a bit. Below both numbers for two weeks, a county goes to green and can reopen more. In February, the state added turquoise, which is even better than green. To get there, a county needs to be under both numbers for a full month. The Department of Health uses these colors to determine how businesses can reopen in each county. And even at the highest level turquoise, you can see businesses still cannot open completely. Restaurants can have 75% capacity for both indoor and outdoor dining. So can close contact businesses like nail salons and barber shops. Recreational facilities can reopen at 50%. And turquoise is where bars can finally open indoors. The level right below turquoise is green. You can see tighter capacity restrictions on restaurants and recreational facilities. And this is the first phase where bars can open outdoors. The next level, yellow. Restaurants are down to 33% capacity indoor, but this is only if they are registered as NM safe certified. Large entertainment venues can open under yellow, but only outdoors. And the most restrictive level is red, which allows for only outdoor dining. Some businesses did not survive the financial impact of the restrictions. And as anchor Ron Burke explains, those that did, well, some are struggling. Right now, restrictions in the state allow for restaurants to operate in some way, whether it's by having people eat outside or having a limited number inside. It's an industry that took a major hit. After the lockdown, restrictions tightened and loosened. Restaurant and brewery owners said it made it difficult to know how to staff the day and how much food to order to make meals. Now, as they're allowed to serve more guests, it's giving the Restaurant Association hope. We're thrilled that we're at these levels right now. Um, I don't think anybody was really expecting the vaccine to work quite so quickly. And so it's, it's very encouraging for not just the restaurant industry, but for New Mexicans as a whole. The Restaurant Association does worry about counties moving backwards, going from one color to a more restrictive color, and how that hurts the momentum of business. Business owners had to get creative to stay in business. We spoke to a designer known for his jewelry. Before 2020, Danny Hart mostly made money at markets like the growers market and the big holiday markets, but public health orders made those events non-existent. Buying habits changed for everyone. People buy big earrings, necklaces, etc., to you know, wear them out and about on the town, to a bar, a, a brewery, a restaurant, whatever it may be, to meet up with friends at social hour. You know, with that not happening, the importance for people to buy that stuff dropped. Many local businesses had to switch to online sales to keep revenue coming in. Businesses are taking advantage of government programs to keep them afloat, but experts believe it will take years for the economy to bounce back. According to TrackTheRecovery.org, here's how small business revenue in our state was impacted last year. Now, this is an odd looking graph because almost all of the categories are below this red line, meaning they are in the negative. Leisure and hospitality all the way at the bottom, including restaurants, took the biggest hit down 68%. Education and health services, this blue line, down 32%. The red line represents retail and transportation, lost 25%. And the yellow line above zero is professional and business services, gained almost 10%. Now the outlook is getting better and we can tell by unemployment claims. Anchor Brittany Hope looks at jobs in our state. Unemployment claims and new filings hit state records over the past year. Although cases of COVID are going down and many of you now have jobs after being laid off or furloughed, thousands of New Mexicans are still struggling to pay the bills. A scene with sounds from a totally different world. That has to be our ending. An unexpected ending came for Eric Stone King, March 26, 2020. When schools shut down, so did his band programs and classes in Albuquerque. I never saw myself as somebody that would ever have to draw unemployment. He's just one of thousands who filed for unemployment benefits for the first time during this pandemic. In March 2020, New Mexico's unemployment rate was more than 6%. Look at the orange line. By July, that skyrocketed to 12.7% well above the national rate of 10.2, the blue line. New Mexico's unemployment rate in 2020 overall was 8.4%, the 11th highest nationwide. 
Why? Probably the main reason is we have a very high dependence on hospitality and tourism jobs here in New Mexico, as related to a lot of other states. Secretary Bill McCamley, the head of the Department of Workforce Solutions, says as soon as the first public health order was released in March, unemployment claims flooded in. We increased the people on unemployment in terms of all the programs that were available by 15 times in the span of three months. That is unheard of. The New Mexicans most impacted by the closures, job losses, and furloughs? Secretary McCamley says those who are younger work low-wage jobs, women, and people of color. Recent data shows how our dependence on tourism is impacting those rates. The accommodations and food service industry, which includes hotels, motels, restaurants, and breweries, in February 2021 alone had the most claimants, nearly 20 Right now, being out of work, can't afford that. Magdalena Colosi is one of those workers. She worked at the Santa Ana Star Casino and Hotel and was furloughed in March 2020 for six months. And then got called back. And then two months later, they decided because of the high cases of COVID to close down again. Her family has been relying solely on her husband's income. Those funds are running out fast. Right now, it's probably through this month, and then we're going to hit hard times. Hard times still being had, from those in hospitality to musicians and teachers who miss this. hoping when school starts back up, I can get my programs going, whatever that may mean, with whatever modifications that's going to require. For now, Eric says he's thankful unemployment benefits just got extended through the summer thanks to Congress passing a new relief bill. He says he'll be home staying safe with his favorite student, his daughter. As vaccines speed up and the state continues to reopen, Workforce Solutions is now working on new programs to get New Mexicans back to work. The department says they will soon release a new hotline for you to call if you do need help. Of course, people are leaning on help from our food banks like never before. Take a look at this view from Sky 7. You can see the need. Cars wrapped around a parking lot ahead of the holidays waiting for help from Roadrunner Food Bank. Last year, they gave out almost 4,000 more tons of food than the year before. The need is still here. The workers are planning more drive through distributions in the coming months. Just before spring break last year, the governor sent kids and teachers home and classes began online. That has not changed for many districts in our area. Shelly Rabando explains the impact it's having on New Mexico's kids. Kids who have been in school have had to adapt to a new way of learning. Now that we're almost a year into either remote or hybrid, the experts are seeing the toll it's taking on our kids. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham gave school districts the opportunity for kids to go back into the classroom, but the Albuquerque Public School System made the decision not to return for the remainder of this academic year. A disappointment for many parents, like Chris Parchert, a dad and former educator. He's watched his seven-year-old son, a first grader at APS, struggle. He's never been a fan of being at home. Um, I think he was really um, depressed when this all started back in March. Um, and we started to see... Um, we started to see a lot more anxiety to the point where we not only had him in therapy, but we were um, we were considering um, medicating him. A toll on motivation, mental health and overall development that health professionals say could be a lot tougher to overcome than just the academics once this is over. I do think that we're seeing increased amounts of depression and anxiety from the social isolation um, from the, the lack of interaction with other adults besides their family members. Dr. Alexander Sivanovich is an Albuquerque pediatrician and the president of the New Mexico Pediatric Society. We're just seeing skyrocketing numbers of anxiety and depression, suicide attempts. Some of the key reasons a district in Nevada decided to reopen for in-person learning after 18 of its students took their own lives. I am seeing younger kids with anxiety and depression than I ever have seen. Teachers unions saying they want a vaccine before returning to class, but the CDC says vaccinating teachers is not necessary to reopen schools safely. And the American Academy of Pediatrics has repeatedly stressed the importance of kids returning to the classroom. I absolutely agree with that. I think we need to get our kids back in school 
as quickly as we can safely do. I think we need to prioritize teachers getting the COVID vaccine. Stanford University released a study showing the classroom lockdown in New Mexico is adding up to some startling numbers. In reading, kids losing an average of close to 100 days, almost a full school year. In some school districts, it's closer to 161 days lost. Math, even worse. The average loss closer to 208 days. I do think that there has been some tremendous damage done. I do think that when the kids do go back, I think that the schools need to be prepared to handle a lot of potentially almost, you know, PTSD-like symptoms. A long road ahead that hasn't even started yet for districts and the students they serve. I am very concerned that we're going to have long-term effects uh, in this age group, in this generation. Students in Rio Rancho are back in the classroom. That district approved starting a hybrid model in February. The state wants all New Mexico kids back in a classroom by April 5th. Right now, teachers are a priority to be vaccinated by the end of March. School districts are encouraged to hold class and lunchtime outdoors when the weather's nice. Air purification, sanitizing, mask wearing, and social distancing are also priorities. Ultimately, it's up to parents to decide if they want their kids back in the classroom. The University of New Mexico is offering hybrid classes now, so students are attending some classes in person and doing others from their computer at home. All the classrooms were reconfigured to put six feet between everyone in a classroom. Despite limited in-person learning last year, UNM's main campus saw an increase in freshman enrollment in the fall of 2020, seven and a half percent from the year before. The state is tracking all kinds of data about the virus, and as Todd Kurtz explains, they're even looking at where people who got it had been before testing positive. With each one of those cases, the state tracks where the infected person has been, trying to trace their steps to see when and where they could have spread the virus to others. KOAT spent weeks fighting to get data from the state that shows where people had been in the days leading up to testing positive for COVID. More than 180,000 New Mexicans have tested positive for COVID-19. The exhaustion was unreal. Ashlyn Padilla is one of them. The chest pain and the breathing was super labored and really odd, and I don't have asthma, and I've never had any kind of lung issues. She was one of the first cases in the state. But I knew this has to be this coronavirus that we we're just hearing about. It wasn't a thing really on the news. So how and did she point, get it? I have an idea. She thinks she caught it on a plane. And that was before wearing masks. So I wasn't wearing a mask and nobody else was wearing a mask. When she tested positive, she got a call from the state health department. They first asked if I could remember every person that I was in contact with, and then I gave them their information, emails, phone numbers. The people asking those questions are contact tracers. Unless you have a known exposure, it's not always very clear how, uh, how an individual contracted COVID. Dr. Jeff Salvin Harmon says contact tracing can slow the spread of COVID-19 by finding out who people that test positive have been around and where they may have spread the virus going back two weeks. People potentially infected can be warned so they can isolate or get tested. Contact tracing is really the, the most vital tool to understanding the routes of transmission. Even when we can't pin it down to an exact source, when we can say it's very likely to have come from having been at this location or being in contact with these people or deviating from the, the COVID safe practices in these ways. Target 7 wanted to know what state contact tracers learned from conversations with thousands of New Mexicans infected with COVID. Target 7 obtained the data for the past seven months that shows where people with COVID had been prior to testing positive. Look at how it all breaks down. 12% of the people who tested positive for COVID-19 said they had traveled outside of the state in the past two weeks. 5% had gone to church, 2% the gym, 9% had attended some sort of a gathering, and 29% had gone shopping. That chart shows that restaurants are not part of the problem and that we need to feel safe going back into restaurants. The data shows 8% had been to a restaurant or brewery. Carol Wright with the Restaurant Association took notice of that number. Restaurants in New Mexico have been unfairly targeted. She said restaurants have struggled to survive the public health order restrictions. The governor has said data from contact tracing is how they decide what stays open and what closes. Now we took the data Target 7 analyzed to the governor. She said one of the reasons restaurants and breweries are so low 
is because of her restrictions. My take is because they've been closed so that there's just not that opportunity. Because if you look at the data when we open them, that data shifts significantly during that time period. This chart published on the state's website illustrates what the governor is talking about. The number of COVID cases at restaurants, which is represented by the green line, uh, you can see as things started to open back up in September, the number of cases at restaurants also goes back up. But shopping, which is the yellow line, has always been on top. Almost a year later, I'm finally feeling better. When Padilla yeah. got the phone call from a contact tracer, she said she had no problem telling them where she had been, but not everyone does that. Yeah. According to the state, about 35% of the people don't even answer. They were wonderful and helpful, and you don't feel like you're in trouble. You're just trying to get the word out there that I was there and could have possibly gotten you sick. We also looked at data from nursing homes and found 4% of positive cases came from there or a long term care facility. There is no question the vaccines have been a game changer for New Mexico, but getting them out to every corner of the state is a monumental task. We take a look at the logistics behind getting shots administered. Plus the spirit that, that the Palo gathering of nations generates. That's what we're trying to keep going. Events canceled or forced to go virtual, but a year later, some organizers are looking to bring people back. And struggles still being faced by New Mexico athletes, all still ahead on Coronavirus Impact, our recovery in New Mexico. When the coronavirus started spreading from continent to continent, New Mexico took advantage of the many scientists working in this state at our national labs for ways to forecast the virus here and ways to stop the spread. Sandia Labs has worked on 80 different COVID-19 projects. They've studied how droplets spread when we sneeze or cough, and they're looking for ways to make those high quality N95 masks our healthcare workers wear fit better and last longer. And remember, when there was a concern, hospitals would run out of ventilators. Well, Sandia created a way to help, an attachment for medical equipment that already existed to solve that problem. Scientists say they are partnering with many agencies across the globe to invent ways to make the pandemic more manageable. Experts at Los Alamos National Lab and Sandia National Labs partnered with our hospitals to build a model to help flatten the curve. They also built the model to predict how cases will change given current trends and analyze schools and how the virus could spread in classrooms. The state used science and data to make categories for who gets the vaccine first and how they're picked for an appointment. Those categories are going to be changing as the vaccine supply increases. Nancy Laughlin shows us how the vaccine is rolled out in New Mexico from when it arrives in the state to when it gets put in your arm. When it comes to these shots, there is simply more demand than supply. Each week, the feds decide how much vaccine goes to each state. Once it arrives, the New Mexico Department of Health decides where it goes from there. We've been looking at things like case positivity rate in a given county and social vulnerability. The vaccine is distributed to health providers who give out the shots. At Loveless Biomedical, it is a well-oiled machine. Oh. Here's a look at how they get that Pfizer vaccine out, a vaccine that must be kept in freezing temps. Once out of the freezer, it's sorted into plastic bags, then put into large freezer containers. Then the National Guard steps in. Kept in very cold containers, the guard hand delivers the vaccine with the clock ticking. They have to be used in five days. With all distribution, if there's any risk of any vaccine expiring, providers contact the state and they get the word out. If that happens, um, we can help push additional invitations to them. Uh, through the vaccine registration site. When it comes to distribution, the Department of Health recently updated its health order, reminding New Mexicans, be honest. If you lie on your registration and jump the line, you could face up to a $5,000 fine. Nancy Laughlin, KOT Action 7 News. Like Walgreens, CVS and Albertsons are now being brought on board to vaccinate New Mexicans. Again, though, depends on the supply coming into the state. Our Royal Day learned being able to make a vaccine quickly and in big amounts is a project being worked on here in our state. 
Scientists all over the world and here in New Mexico are working on different vaccines to stop the pandemic. A vaccine in the works at UNMH would be different than the other three on the market now. Here's what it looks like. Scientists are decorating virus-like particles to fake out the virus so the body will build immunity. Their goal is to figure out a way to develop this technology to mass produce an effective vaccine in the future. Pick an event, it was probably canceled or drastically changed in 2020, but organizers of New Mexico's most popular gatherings are already planning for a big 2021. And the state is hoping those events will bring back some much needed tourism dollars as our economy struggles to recover. Throughout the year, New Mexico is home to some major events drawing crowds of people from around the world. But last year, none of those events happened, at least not with people there in person, because mass gatherings were banned. The first to go very early in the pandemic, when we didn't yet know the reach, the gathering of nations. In the summer, the Santa Fe Indian market is advertised as the largest market devoted to Native American arts in the world. It didn't happen. 60,000 people would normally pack Fort Marcy Park in Santa Fe to watch the burning of Zizobra. Old Man Gloom represents the struggles and anguish in all of us, and when he burns, it symbolizes a new beginning, the past going up in smoke. The organizers felt Zizobra was needed more than ever in 2020, so KOAT became the official broadcaster of the event. We heard from people in 14 countries who watched him fall to ashes. At the end of the summer, it became apparent that fall was canceled too. There would be no state fair and no balloon fiesta. But one thing we all look forward to as the smell fills the air, roasted chili. drive through stands were set up around town so New Mexicans could at least get a taste of fall. Those big events mean revenue for Albuquerque's Sunport. So take a look here at this chart. It shows the number of people flying in and out of the Sunport. The top line in blue represents 2019. That bottom line in yellow represents 2020. So look at here where travel just plummeted in April of 2020. That's when lockdowns were in effect and travel came to a near halt. Another thing to notice here is this point in 2019 where it gets pretty high. You can see that's balloon fiesta that year. 527,000 trips were made in and out of the Sunport. It is the biggest time for travel at the Sunport. But yeah, take a look at it in 2020. That's October 2020. The year fiesta was canceled because of COVID. We only have data for January of this year down slightly from December 2020. As Anchor Royal Day explains, the state is hoping at least some of these big events can go on this year with some creative and COVID safe planning. As the number of positive cases and hospitalizations go down, the outlook on events this year is looking up. This particular past year was a bit of a challenge. The drumming and multicolored traditional clothes of Native American dancers will be heard and seen during the Gathering of Nations powwow this April but it'll be online again. It's inevitable that we won't be able to open here and we wouldn't open here until we're sure that it's safe to bring everybody back. This is the second consecutive year organizers have canceled the event inside of Tingley Coliseum at Expo New Mexico. It draws dancers from hundreds of tribes in the US, Canada and Mexico. Derek Matthew says last year's virtual powwow was viewed by more than 700,000 people. He says they're expecting a big and virtual crowd in 2021 as well. So this time around, we're anticipating three to 500 dancers and singers and the outside audience could be in upwards again in the thousands of people. He says they want to keep the spirits of Indian country and those who appreciate Native American culture strong. Keeping the people tuned in, the spirit that, that the power of gathering of nations generates, that's what we're trying to keep going. Also at Expo New Mexico, the State Fair. According to organizers, they will hold their event this September 9th through the 19th. They say it'll be a full fair adjusted accordingly to the current public health order. Staff will put into place COVID safe practices across the fairgrounds. This also goes for vendors. This October, hot air balloons are back.
The theme for the 49th annual International Balloon Fiesta is Time Flies. Organizers say mark your calendars because it is a go for October 2nd through the 10th. Exactly how it'll work this year is still being worked out, but the Balloon Fiesta team says they are planning to launch 600 plus balloons. To Santa Fe now and the Indian market, where hundreds of Native American artists sell their work. Last year, they had a virtual show, and the director tells KOAT it was a success despite the big change. According to the Indian market team, artists had excellent sales. For 2021, the director says they're hopeful to have an in-person market back this August. The board is hoping to make a final decision soon. The director says it looks promising. The Indian market, if it does return, she says may look a little bit different with COVID safe practices. There may even be a hybrid version, half in person and half online. We'll keep you posted. It's been a rough year with our events having to change so quickly, but as things slowly return to normal, the people who put on these events are excited to welcome you and your family back. And it's not just special events. Anchor Ron Burke shows us how our state's tourism industry as a whole is dealing with a hit. One of the nation's most popular parks is hoping to rebound this year. People still visited White Sands National Park during the pandemic, but not a lot. They experienced a 34% drop in visits during the pandemic. I'm feeling so great to be outside. This is like soul food for us. When the slopes opened in the winter of 2020, skiers were relieved even if the lifts had COVID restrictions. Families of friends traveling together can ride lifts together, but single skiers cannot share a bench with anyone. Masks are required and people stay six feet apart in lines. And it's a priority to get tourists back to our state. Anchor Todd Kurtz found out there's a plan to create a rebound. Yeah, it's going to take a while because it's an industry that took a major blow. In 2019, visitor spending was at an all time high, seven and a half billion dollars. Tourism department is expecting more than a four billion dollar loss in tourism because of COVID. It's a big blow to big attractions like the Sandia Tram. 2020 was a rough year. General manager for the Sandia Peak Tram, Michael Donovan, said in a typical year, they have about a quarter of a million riders. In 2020, it was around 60,000. They were shut down twice, 108 days in the spring, and then another 32 days near the end of the year. They did keep some workers employed. The maintenance crew had to keep running the cars. You want a tram to run. You don't just let it sit. Uh, if it sits and things like that, a lot of fluids and we also need to get out and grease the towers and things like that. So there's ongoing maintenance, whether you're operating to the public or not, that has to continue. And you know this pandemic hit the big attractions like the tram all the way to the mom and pop shops on our plazas and the artisans who used to line the sides of those streets. Everything that touches tourism was impacted and that affects our state's bottom line. I want to show you a few graphs here that really emphasize how bad the tourism sector has been hit. First up here, this is statewide travel spending each week during the pandemic compared to that same week from 2019. Every single week is down. The most was 84% in mid April. Unemployment, the orange line here is going to be leisure and hospitality jobs. So just look at this drop when the pandemic hit and still in December were 30,000 New Mexican leisure and hospitality workers without a job. Lastly, statewide occupancy rate where it was before the pandemic and then look at the bottom just drop right there. That's March and April. We've seen some recovery at the hotels here as of more recently, but still just nowhere near where it was before the coronavirus hit. The secretary for the Department of Tourism thinks it'll take six to seven years to get back to our 2019 levels for tourism, but we as New Mexicans can help speed this up right now. More than ever, they are asking you to get out and explore our beautiful state. Even if you've been to a spot before, like the tram, rediscover it. We would love to see them. Top of the Sandias is an amazing place to recreate, rediscover some great hiking trails. Spend your money here, take weekend trips here, visit places you've never been that are right here in the land of enchantment, and I'll see you out there on the road. And now anchor Doug Fernandez shows us how it was not just the pandemic shutting down businesses. In the summer, a time typically big for tourism, many businesses were closed and then damaged during protests. People filled Albuquerque streets asking for change and equality. In this video from June of 2020, you can see fires in downtown Albuquerque and damaged buildings as people protested the death of George Floyd. Even with mass gathering limits, some people masked up in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. About 200 people were at Civic Plaza during this silent protest. 
The fight for equality happened during the pandemic and led to a focus on how the virus was disproportionately impacting underserved communities. Shelley? Minorities in New Mexico have been affected more by the pandemic. Nearly half of our state's COVID cases infected Hispanic or Latino people. That group also makes up 40% of our state's deaths. But vaccination rates are disproportionately low, too. Look at data from the Department of Health here. At the end of February, only 14.6% of Latinos in the state had one vaccine dose. 8% were fully vaccinated. Looking at the black and African American population, almost 11% have one dose, 6% have both. Native Americans are in the group with the most vaccinated people compared to total population. More than a quarter are partially vaccinated and 12% fully. The state added a plan to ensure equity to make sure vaccines go to the most vulnerable of our neighbors. A CDC model used to assess a community and its ability to endure a natural disaster is being used to prioritize people. It takes into account factors like minority status, language and housing and transportation needs. The plan creates walk in and mobile vaccination clinics for neighborhoods where people may not easily be able to get to other areas of town to get the vaccine. There's been a big federal and state push to help our Native American communities. Anchor Kayla Norwood talked to the leaders of several tribes and pueblos. She found out vaccination rates in Indian country are surpassing the rest of the nation. Shelly, Native Americans were hit especially hard by this pandemic. At one point, the Navajo Nation had the highest infection rate per capita in the U.S., surpassing New York. But now tribes are turning things around. The Pueblo of Zia, with a population of 930, once welcomed visitors with open arms, but today is closed off. We're not letting any other community uh, non-community members come in into our reservation. I stayed outside the entrance to speak to their governor because there's still a lockdown nearly one year later. Governor Jerome Lucero says last April the tribe had more than 150 COVID cases and he was one of them. It was I think pretty scary. I think everybody was pretty paranoid from when we first heard our first case and from then on it just Got scary. He said suddenly 13 to 15 percent of their population had contracted COVID and he blamed social gatherings. We are so used to feasting and, you know, I think that's what we miss a lot is our traditions when we're dancing and coming together as, as Pueblo people. Just West is the Navajo Nation, the largest tribe in New Mexico and the United States. I spoke to their president, Jonathan Nez. Per capita, we were highest in the country in COVID positive cases. He's talking about in May when they surpassed New York for the highest infection rate per capita in the U.S. More than 2,300 cases per 100,000 people. Factors that brought them there? President Nez says multiple generations living under one roof and the fact that 30 to 40 percent don't have clean drinking water. CDC telling the, the people throughout this country to uh, wash their hands with soap and water, that's very difficult in Indian country. So to get through this pandemic, he put tough protocols in place like lockdowns and weakened curfews. Plus, and I think information uh, to the Navajo people was critical throughout this public health emergency. Uh, Dr. Fauci was on our town hall meeting. I think this can serve almost as a model to so many other locations outside of the Navajo Nation. And by September, Fauci praised their progress. Today, case numbers are down to the teens and the primary focus is on the vaccine. Just let everybody know if we're telling people to, to take the vaccine, then we're going to take it ourselves to bring confidence. And I, I, there's an overwhelming interest in taking the vaccine now. Back in Zia Pueblo, things are looking up too. Governor Lucero told me 80% of the tribe is now vaccinated. Feels awesome. We're moving in the right direction. It's the way I feel. But then again, I can't trust the I can't trust the virus. We got hit hard one time and I don't want to get hit hard again. Right now, one third of those on the Navajo Nation are vaccinated. President Nez says he hopes to get that to 50% and reopen their school soon. Governor Lucero believes Zia Pueblo can get over 90% of the tribe vaccinated by the end of the month. Our frontline workers heroes during this pandemic, but for those in training, it's been a road that has seen a lot of people quit. Why those still on the path say the pain is worth the price next.
It's something many young people aim for. They look forward to getting to high school, a sort of rite of passage where they can test themselves against their peers, working hard to develop skills that could launch them to the next level, armed with a college scholarship that could set the direction for the rest of their lives. The last year has taken three local student athletes we met in vastly different directions. As New Mexico shut the door on competitive sports in early 2020, it caused them to reassess the future in ways they never imagined. We all have this plan A that, you know, yeah. my senior year is going to come around. Uh, it's my turn. Ryan Cook was hoping to have a full senior season as starting quarterback at La Cueva High School. Instead, he says the best he can count on now is a couple spring games. COVID restrictions cost him momentum he could have built toward a possible Division I college scholarship, forcing his family to consider a change in game plan. You know, uh, my parents and I have talked about, you know, going Juco. Um, I have a lot of football left in me. While Ryan could be headed to junior college to boost his stock, a pair of standout soccer players from Rio Rancho High created very different options outside of high school. When it became clear in 2020 that COVID would threaten their upcoming seasons, they at least had an outlet in club soccer. Once COVID hit, you just kind of got to, you just got to kind of deal with it. No sense in dwelling on it. Lamar Bynum gave up basketball to focus solely on soccer his senior year. I went the whole year of 2020 without the idea of I'm going to have a season or not. What's going to be my next move? His opportunities changed. Lamar was already playing club soccer with New Mexico Rush when in January he signed with the inaugural New Mexico United Academy team, made up of elite players from the state. And he's hoping to get back a piece of his senior season since APS recently okayed the return of sports. But like many other athletes, Lamar doesn't have an early commitment to a college. He had expected to make a decision by last August. Now I want to try and commit before the summer, before June, but I'm always flexible. If it's not the right option, not the right fit, I'm not going to force it. Instead of spending her freshman year at Rio Rancho High, 14-year-old soccer standout Leah Varela is enrolled at famed IMG Academy in Florida, where she's getting expert instruction and competing with other elite players her age from around the country. It's a major financial commitment, but her parents felt staying in New Mexico was not an option. You know, you're 14, 15 players deep of, of top players and being able to train with them on a daily basis and being able to compete her game has has improved tremendously. Here with coaches, and now we have nutrition coaches, mental coaches. It's just further understanding um, not only the soccer side, but what goes on mentally. Leah thinks it's unfair that sports was taken away from students in New Mexico, and so does Ryan Cook. The La Cueva quarterback sent game video to college coaches, hoping to get a chance to impress that COVID took away. Missing out on a uh, guaranteed 10 games and, and getting myself into the varsity speed and play style and everything, and then having a limited amount of practice, it's gonna be tough. Another of Ryan's concerns is there may be fewer scholarships available because of the so-called COVID year. The NCAA's granting of an extra year of eligibility to athletes whose season was impacted by the pandemic. Now, NM United would normally be playing games right now because of COVID. The season still has not started, but when they do kick off, it looks like fans will get to be there for the action. United plans to play home matches at Isotopes Park again with about 3,100 fans allowed. Of course, masks will be required and fans will be spaced out in the stands. Still, this is a big step forward from last year when the team played every game away from home, meaning they have not played a match at the lab since the fall of 2019. The Isotopes needed permission from both the state and Major League Baseball to begin their season. MLB's OK came with some significant changes. Opening day was pushed back one month to May 6th to allow minor league players more time to be eligible for the COVID vaccine. And the schedule was slashed to 120 games, 60 home and 60 away. Now, each series will be six games to cut down on travel. The Isotopes will open at home against the Sugarland Skeeters with limited fan attendance as long as Bernalillo County stays out of the red. Masks will be required and fans will be spaced out at the ballpark. The team is working on its ticket process. Still to come on coronavirus impact, our recovery in New Mexico, hugging a loved one, something we have taken for granted until now. After a year on the front lines, a local family is finally able to see their mother in person.
Families all over our state have been physically separated by the virus in order to protect each other, visiting each other through barriers at senior living facilities or by using technology. But now as vaccinations increase, one family is showing us there is hope to reconnect in person. We're all doing selfies. Yeah. <laughs> Meet Lena. <laughs> Jay. It was supposed to be um, Cinderella Day. And their mom, Tess. Like many of you, the last year has been tough. Because so many things happened. Last January, Tess was hospitalized with pneumonia. Shortly after being released, COVID hit. And I did have to be on oxygen for a while. And uh, so the idea that this COVID was something that could really hurt your lungs your breathing mechanism. That was scary. Tess lives in a retirement facility and her daughters both work in healthcare. And bringing her home honestly would have compromised her more because of our exposure. It was very nerve wracking not to be able to um, eyeball her in person, for instance, for signs of illness. Keeping physically distance was tough for the family, but they found ways to look after their mother. We went and had lunch together under her balcony. We were in a parade and decorated cars and drove them to her facility for her to see us. And Tess learned some new skills. What you see is what you get. And we Zoomed a lot as a, as a family. We had Zoom meals together, Zoom happy hours. She learned to do FaceTime. She heard us say a lot of times, Mom, your thumb is in the way. <laughs> And she would be telling a story, but we, we... All we see is the ceiling, Mom! <laughs> Still, something was missing. Being in quarantine, you know, it wasn't fun. You wanted to be out. You wanted to have the social contact. Now, flash forward a year later. Nice. Going to St. James T. House. Oh, vaccines have been distributed to healthcare workers and many seniors, allowing this family to reunite in person. We went out to eat. We thought, wow, is this what it's like? And while they realize they are fortunate, they have this advice for families still waiting to see each other in person again. Don't let your guard down yet. It's feeling like things are easing up, but it's really not until everybody has their shot. Having that vaccine and being able to be together again uh, is worth the wait. Just this sense of, of maybe not being afraid of, of feeling yourself again. This weekend, Tess will celebrate her 87th birthday. And while we tried to get the scoop on any kind of celebration, her daughters didn't want to spoil the surprise. Sasha. We've seen the emotional toll the pandemic has taken on our healthcare workers. Well, now we're seeing the future of that industry. Students inspired by the dedication of nurses and doctors right now. Their photos have gone viral from marks from wearing face masks for hours. The tears after some of the most stressful days. Our healthcare heroes have been tested physically and emotionally this past year. Working with the doctors, the nurses, um, all of the medical staff, everybody that's in the hospital, they're drained. You know, the hours are long, especially when we're, it's just like patient after patient. I was exhausted. I felt beat up. I was working almost seven days a week, anywhere from eight to 12 to 16 hours a day. Meet Randy Gallegos. You kind of feel like your hands are tied and there's not much that you can do. And Christopher Auckland. It's like a call of duty, almost like fulfilling a purpose. Both first year nursing students in New Mexico who have seen the roller coaster ride of this pandemic, with Randy working in the ER and Christopher working as a phlebotomist. I remember like half the team just up and quitting. And I don't know if maybe like my mindset of I still want to become a nurse is kind of what kept me there. This as nursing school adapts to the virus. Our director of nursing, the program was kind of talked about how it's going to be a lot more challenging because you're not in a classroom getting that hands on experience. And she's like, the dedication needs to be there 110%. Each day spent motivating themselves, a challenge they face today for a better tomorrow. Don't let it stop you. Like, follow your dreams. It's going to take time. But things have gotten better. COVID cases are going down, and hospitals are now allowing visitors. This is something health leaders say is making a vast difference. It gave them a sense of relief, having uh, and a relief from isolation, especially. The emotional toll of having to have make that connection um, between family and patient without the family being able to be present was just an overwhelming feeling of responsibility. And they had to, to try and make that connection with uh, 
in very, very severe circumstances. I love to see the light at the end of the tunnel now. So kindly finally see that like we're getting normal patients in with their toe pain or their ankle pain. It's such a relief. Both students say seeing the toll this pandemic had on the medical field did not turn them away. Instead, it did just the opposite. You want to have the ability to help, you know, to be there, to be able to do something and not feel like you're just stuck watching it. I kind of just had this idea in my head, like I can't change the world, but I can change like the corner the, of the world I live in. Every step, every, you know, 20,000 steps in the 12 hour shift, totally worth it. Both Randy and Christopher have at least another year and a half left before graduating from nursing school, but they say that can't come soon enough. Our next generation of nurses ready to hit the ground running to help change one person's life at a time. Many of those healthcare workers are now spending time at vaccination clinics. The experts say getting any one of the brands available is key to stopping this pandemic. President Joe Biden's administration has promised more supply to Americans so the country can get closer to that herd immunity level of having about 70% of the population vaccinated. It's a hopeful feeling, but there's more work to do because new strains of the virus are in our state and the country. While scientists work to tackle challenges, we as New Mexicans have learned from the experience of the last year. Coronavirus has made an impact and health experts say we'll likely see more slips and surges of the virus, but we're focused on recovery, the information and tools needed to get our state and New Mexicans economically and physically healthy. Thank you for joining us for Coronavirus Impact, Our Recovery in New Mexico. We leave you tonight with images of hope and healing and tributes to our healthcare heroes.